This, this talk uh, today is about how we upset someone. Uh, and that's never, it's never a good thing to have to talk about. Uh, because when you upset someone, it means that you've done something wrong. It means that you've changed something that they liked. Uh, it means that you've broken something they expected to keep working. Uh, and so this is where we start from. Um, poor Skelsec uh, is very disappointed. Skelsec is probably not someone you've come across before. Uh, we certainly hadn't, so we dug into what he works on and checked out his GitHub. Uh, one of his projects is PyPyCats, which those familiar with inf information security will be aware of Mimikatz, which is one of the most popular hacking tools that gets used. He owns the pure Python implementation of that. Uh, he's also got proof of concepts for a Kerberos attack in pure Python, also a couple of CVEs in pure Python. Maybe upsetting this guy by breaking stuff is not actually that bad a thing. He doesn't seem to be doing nice stuff with Python. The way that we broke him is by implementing PEP578 for Python, uh, which is auditing hooks and can be used for security transparency. So that's the subject of today's talk. We're going to go into details about what was changed, what's been added, uh, and how you can use it to make people like Skelsec, hackers using Python, very unhappy. <laughs> so my name's Steve Dower. Uh, I'm a CPython core developer. I'm the original author of PEP578. Uh, also worked with a few other people on it. I especially want to acknowledge James Powell. Did a lot of the implementation work for that and was a big help. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Zuba. Uh, I also work at Microsoft. Hi, I'm Christian Heimes. I'm also a CPython core developer. I was the BDFL delegate, so the person that uh, work with Steve to get the pep landed. Uh, also, I work for Red Hat, um, and you can find me at Christian Hymas on Twitter too. So today's agenda, we're going to first explain what are actually audit hooks and why should you use them, um, how you can use audit hooks to improve security of your programs, and finally, Steve will go through some Windows-based example. I'm going to go through some Linux Unix-based examples, and we're closing with a summary. Oh, you got the clicker, thank you. Uh, so, a runtime, oh yeah, that's probably easier. <laughs> um, so, the runtime hooks. So, it's only a small fraction of things you actually do if you want to create a secure environment for your processes and for your uh, services. Uh, it's not a whole solution, It's a small part of the solution. Uh, with the runtime hooks, the auditing hooks we have, you can uh, see what the interpreter is doing internally, hook into different parts of the interpreter from like which files are my process opening, uh, which sockets I'm connecting, uh, and uh, compiling, executing bytecode, uh, importing models, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. By default, we, these hooks don't do anything, so they're just empty stops. And if you don't hook any of these uh, auditing hooks, use them. They are also don't impact the performance of the interpreter, which is probably something that several of you ke um, care about. And these hooks are designed for security engineers um, to inspect what's going on. It's something not like ready to use solution, but you have to build your own solution, the foundation to create them. And as a security engineer, if you want to take care about uh, creating a secure environment for your services, there are multiple things you should do. First, of course, please install security updates. And then you want to run your services as a limited user account. Don't run them like as root or as admin. And then please install security updates. Well, then do something like use a firewall, restrict your processes, and yeah, install security updates. And then don't install random stuff from the internet. Actually control what you deploy on your machines. Inspect what you control on your machines. Don't install like a new version or uh, don't uh, fall trap for like typo squatting where somebody has a PyPI page that sounds very similar but has actually a typo. And yeah, install security updates, please. And maybe at the end, if you have done all that and even more things, then you might think about adding all these auditing security hooks. So let's have a look at what hooking this actually involves. Uh, we have two sets of APIs for this. It is meant to be used as a security feature. If you're that committed to doing this, you should really be thinking about compiling Python from source, controlling those sources so you know where it came from, and possibly modifying the runtime itself. The aim of the hooks is to provide a C API to make that safe and reliable uh, so you're not constantly modifying the full source code of C Python. There's also a Python API for hooking into these uh, events as well which is very helpful for testing, and there's a few scenarios where that makes sense. 
but these are the general APIs. So you're going to have some kind of callback, whether in C or in Python. And then it's a simple call. It's either PySys, add audit hook, or it's sys.addaudithook from Python. That's going to give you a callback that is called on each of these events. These <coughs> events can be called from anywhere. So they, they will get called on a variety of operations, a variety of contexts that Python may be running in. Certain locks may be held. They're very low level. And you do need to be careful about what you do in it. Uh, but there are, uh, for the most part, they're not that complicated to implement now that you actually get a callback for it. The pros and cons of each of these approaches are important to consider. Obviously, implementing in C is more complex than implementing in Python. But the upside is it's going to run faster. It's going to be harder to bypass for an attacker who may be executing code in your Python that you don't expect. If you've added your hook in C, you're still going to get those events. There's very little that an attacker can do running pure Python code to stop you from receiving these events if you've written a C hook. Uh, but it does also require compiling and deploying your own copy of Python. Uh, now, Linux users are probably not at all concerned by that, because you're almost certainly doing it anyway. People running on Windows, Mac OS are less likely to be doing that, so that's a bit more of a step up <coughs> in complexity. Uh, but it is worth it if you're looking to enforce stronger security boundaries. Doing it from Python, of course, is very easy, very convenient. You can do sys.addaudithook print, and that will give you a printout of every single event that's going on uh, very simply. The downside is it's per subinterpreter. Again, if you're not familiar with subinterpreters, uh, have a look at those. They're a very complex area, but if you are using a Python hook, it's only per subinterpreter. You'll need to keep adding it to each one. Uh, and it does run slower. You may notice more of a performance impact if you have Python based hooks than C based hooks. What kind of events can you expect to appear while you're running? This is a small sample. That link at the bottom has the full table of uh, almost the full table of events that CPython currently raises. Other implementations of Python may add different events. Uh, and certain libraries that you use can also raise events. I'll come back to that. But here's a handful of a selection. The built-in's input function is going to let you know anytime input is called. It's also going to send a separate message with whatever is typed in. Your production server is probably not using input. And if for some reason input starts happening on your production machine, you probably want to know about that. Things like exec, import, compile, very useful. You want to know what code's running. And you especially want to know if code that you didn't write is running. We have more on that, uh, more on being able to prevent that in the first place later on. But this is the way that you can at least be notified that someone is dynamically compiling code on your production server. Uh, socket new, and there's a range of socket events that will be raised. Uh, glob, glob. Just in case, that's actually a very common thing that attackers are going to do if they manage to execute code on your machine. They want to find out what files you've got there. They want to see what tools they have access to. They want to know what user accounts are set up. If you start getting events for Glob, again, if you know that your app uses Glob, you can probably ignore them. If your app never uses Glob and you start seeing it, that's a good warning sign. So what should you do with an event? You get the callback. What are you going to do? The first option you always have is to do nothing at all. Depending on your, uh, your risk profile or your threat model, certain events, it's very useful to do nothing with them at all. Just ignore them. You can log it. You can write out the details somewhere and keep a semi-permanent or a permanent record of all the things that your app has been doing. You can abort the operation. From inside your callback, if you raise an exception, most of the time, it's going to interrupt the action. So if a socket raises an event saying, I'm about to connect to this address, and you throw an exception, it's just going to abort it. It's going to be canceled. Your code will get an exception instead, and that socket will never be connected to. So there's that option. Uh, and you can abort everything. If there's an event that you recognize that you really, really don't want to happen, you can just call exit and tear the whole thing down. But the correct answer is to log it. And this, is, this comes out of uh, an approach to security that's known as assume breach, where a lot of people and kind of the traditional approach to security is you set up a really strong boundary so nobody can get in, and then you're fine. And as long as nobody gets in, you're fine. And it turns out that the attackers are better at getting in than we are at keeping them out. And you only need one gap in that wall for someone to get through. And once they're in, if all your defenses are in that wall, you have nothing. Think about an office building. Your office building has locks on the doors. That'll keep people out. But there's also motion detectors and security cameras on the inside which are completely useless if your doors are perfect. Why are they there? Your doors aren't perfect. People will get in. You want to know about it. 
Think of these auditing hooks as security cameras or motion detectors inside your app so that you know when someone's moving about in there. You will see legitimate people moving about in there. You need to be able to filter those out, but if you're not logging it, you have no chance. Logging everything is very important. And your first instinct is probably to filter out events that aren't that interesting, that aren't that relevant, and say, we don't actually need to keep this. We can save disk space, we can save network traffic by not logging certain events. That's actually a really bad idea. Uh, if you have complete logs, maybe you're not checking everything. Maybe you're not constantly reading them. But when it comes to a retrospective analysis, when you discover your emails being <coughs> published on torrent sites or wherever they get published these days, uh, and you realize that someone's in your system, how are you going to find them? If you have all of the logs, you've got a chance of working backwards and locating what those attackers have been doing in your system. Anomaly detection is a growing field, especially using machine learning, to keep kind of a profile of what events happen during normal operation, recognize when that changes, even without someone having to review every single thing that's going on. Uh, and of course, incident response. If you have a live persistent threat inside your network and you want to find out what that's doing, what services it's approaching, what IPs it's pinging, uh, which Twitter accounts it's looking at for its next set of instructions, having all of these in your logs already will give you that information, will help you expel them nice and quickly. Premature log filtering is going to cripple your defense. So log everything. And as I said, there's a way to create auditing events as well. For the most part, the intent is to listen to them. But if you're developing a library, if you're developing various extensions, then it can be very helpful to create your own events so that you know when these things are going on. So there's a C API, which is based on the pi build value API, if you're familiar with that one. It takes a format string for the arguments that are going to be passed in and the name of the event. Uh, if you have the option to use the C API, use the C API. There is a Python API, sys.audit, which Similarly, takes a list of arguments. It's very easy to bypass that one. You can reassign sys.audit to another function, and then those events go away. Uh, so it's very useful for testing, but if you can use the native API, that's strongly recommended. Uh, we recommend in the PEP that third-party uh, events should include the module name as part of the event name. Helps namespace things. If you have two modules raising the same event for different purposes, that's probably going to cause issues uh, so putting the name of the module that you're raising it from as part of the event name helps keep things separated so there are no collisions. And just as a recommendation, validate the parameters you're going to pass in first, then raise the event, and then do the operation. That means that hooks can assume that the arguments are going to be valid on the way in, and they're not going to, you're not going to end up logging things that are just going to raise an exception and not run anyway. But it gives the hooks a chance to abort the operation. So if you notice something going on, even if you want to quickly deploy to expel a, a current uh, persistent threat, then you may have a very specific case where you want to start raising an exception for a certain IP. And if you've implemented these events in a way that the operation is already going, you can't actually interrupt that with a hook that's going to raise, uh, raise an exception to abort it. So you want to try and put the auditing events after parameters are known to be valid, known to be the correct types, the correct uh, within range, but before you actually do anything with them. Uh, and next, Christian is going to tell us about how you can just stop code running in the first place. Yeah. So a rather special case, there's not a hook, but a new piece of code we added, uh, the uh, IO open code function. It's, if you look at how usually binaries are executed with shared libraries and native ex um, code, uh, the kernel and the operating system know the difference between yet actually code that runs on your CPU and that's data for the code. But with Python, we have like this rather bad case that PyC files are considered data for the CPU and the operating system. And this IA open code function is the first step to teach the operating system the intent that we're going to open something that's going to be executable code. Um, so. This is a simple function that basically boils down to just doing opening the path we path through uh, for uh, binary read only and returns a file-like object. So it doesn't have to be actually a file object. We have some examples later on that use bytes.io that looks like a file, uh, but it's not actually a file. If you hook into uh, the C API, you can override that, but only 
uh, but you should only do that in the beginning when you, um, before you actually start the rest of the interpreter. You pass in the callback, and the callback gets called with the file name and additional user data. You can add custom information to your callback. And what can you do with the IO open code thing? For example, you can verify different uh, attributes on the file. You can check properties of the file. Uh, the actual regular file you're opening, you're maybe opening a pipe or a socket or a, some kind of special file or a file on a file system that you don't expect to load any uh, code from. You can validate the content of the file. So you can compare it to checksum. You can do like code signing. Uh, you can make sure that nobody, while you're working on the file, does uh, something with the file. You can lock the file content before you load it. And instead of what I mentioned before, turning the, the actual file, you first load the content into a memory buffer, into a bytes IO, and then do all the operation. Because if you uh, read a file like two times, first time to do like a checksumming, and the second time to actually turn it to Python, then there's a possibility that an attacker can use a time of check, time of use attack. So uh, if an attacker can just uh, intercept the second reading of a file and replace the content with some malicious code, that's bad. So always first do something, read the whole content into a buffer, and then validate the buffer and pass down the buffer down. And there's some caveats. Uh, one thing is, um, if you implement that in C, uh, it's executed while uh, the import hook is hold. So you can't do another import while doing this hooking. And um, some calls may assume that a actual regular file that's backed up by a file descriptor or a physical file in, on the file system. Uh, but all the Python standard import system doesn't assume that just requires a file-like object. Uh, some additional things you have to do if you want to uh, validate the files and uh, deal with the IO open hook is also you don't want to have any additional code in your project that like bypasses the whole IO open uh, infrastructure. So. Uh, in Python, in 3.8, uh, we replaced all code for importing and uh, several other things like zip import, and we plan to do that for pickle um, with the IO open code thing. But if you bypass that in your own application using like compile exec or exec file in Python 2, well. Uh, other parts, you want to make sure that you load files that come actually from the file system. So you can use introspection and other file system and operating system tools to verify what kind of files you load. So if you allow like dash C, where you can just pass an arbitrary Python code, or do like uh, curl some evil side shell to Python 3, shell and data in, then um, the admin has no chance to see which code you're actually executing and also restrict which kind of environment you uh, have, like uh, variables can play fun funny tricks with your Python program, and also from which places you're allowed to load code. So maybe you don't want to allow it, uh, to read code from like temptier when temptier is the only place where an unrestricted user can store any files on disk or a home directory. Maybe you want to restrict that. So now we come into the Windows section where Steve will tell you how you can hook in all the hooks on Windows. Right, here is where we get to real kind of applications and a few samples of things. So I'm gonna go through three points of integration that exist in Windows that this enables, which were previously unavailable. So these are operating system features that are really powerful security features. I suspect there's a very <coughs> low number of Windows developers in the room uh, because that's fairly typical for these conferences, unfortunately. Uh, but these, these are features that get cheers from the, the Windows security focused conferences because they're really powerful at locking things down. With these hooks, with the open code function, these become available to Python developers. Uh, and as a security engineer in those contexts, you can integrate Python code and your Python apps into the rest of the security infrastructure. Uh, all of these code samples are available at this GitHub repo. Uh, and so you can go and grab those. You can get a copy of Python 3.8 beta 2 and compile them and try them out for yourself. So the first one is the Windows event log. The kind of canonical example of code that you don't want running on your production servers is something like this. Uh, and in fact, this is a, well, no, this is a great example. So you'll see that it's called SPython. SPython is kind of the, the code name that we've been using for a Python that has more things enabled. There's a lot of good reasons for a development cycle to have a Python binary that doesn't have these things enabled and use an SPython binary in production that does have it enabled. That lets your developers use 
uh, a whole lot of things that might otherwise be restricted. <clears throat> and then when you deploy, if you don't allow that Python binary to exist, it also um, it takes away an entry point. There's also some interesting kind of semi-research, uh, which I haven't linked to, but I probably should have, where some would say this is secure, uh, security by obscurity, where simply renaming your Python executable hides the fact that attackers can run Python when they get on your machine, and they're just gonna figure it out and do it anyway. Um, someone did a study where they changed their SSH port by one um, and saw like a 99.9% .9 reduction in attacks. And if you think that's a bad thing, then I'm gonna disagree. Uh, if you can reduce 99.9% .9 of attacks by changing the name of something, then you should just do that. So anyway, this is kind of the canonical example. Uh, if you get onto a machine and you have the opportunity to one, run one command, that command is very often, uh, surprisingly often for most people, going to be something like python c, uh, decrypt this base64 string, and then execute it. And quite often that string involves opening up uh, URL lib and downloading more files and decrypting those and executing those. Uh, in this case, it just prints hello Europython, uh, which is a, a much better option than all the rest of them. But this is fairly common. Looking at that command, you can't see what that's going to do. You don't know what that's going to do. And typically once an attacker is inside Python, you have no idea what it's doing until you see the results being published on, um, you know, uh, that, what is it? What's, what's the site with all the passwords? Have I, been pwned? have I been pwned? That's when you find out that someone's been doing this. <clears throat> but we want to find out sooner. So the Windows event log is kind of the central uh, event stream service on Windows. It has a handful of integrations with other more advanced features that are really helpful. Uh, there's an event log viewer for starters, which, okay, you need to be able to actually look at the events that are, that are in there. The valuable ones from a security perspective, event forwarding, you can configure it to automatically send all logged events to another machine, and that completely prevents anyone on that machine from clearing the logs because the messages have already been taken somewhere else. You have protected event logging where all events can be encrypted immediately uh, with asymmetrical encryption, which means you, uh, you can't actually read back the log on that machine. You have to take it to a machine that's enabled for it. Uh, clearing and modifying logs automatically adds a new event. So you will be notified if someone clears a log, even if it's you, uh, because one of the best ways to find out that someone is doing stuff on your machine that they shouldn't be is your event logs get cleared. Uh, so knowing about that is, is helpful. But it also gives a very simple API for logging the events in the first place. <clears throat> uh, which in this case, so this is my hook for when code gets compiled. These two lines and a little bit of boilerplate that's been generated elsewhere is gonna record the event. It's gonna record the code that's being compiled and the alleged file name it's coming from. The compile function takes a parameter that says the file name. We can't necessarily trust that, but the code is legitimate. We know that that's what's being compiled. This is gonna to lead to the event viewer where you can see at the bottom, uh, the event has been logged. We're compiling from a string, and there is the actual code that's been decrypted from that base64 pass into exec. And so now because that code has been run through SPython, we actually have a record of what that was. And if that's been sent to a central machine, maybe we're monitoring a thousand machines, but this gets red flagged on our central server, and we can see that 10 of those machines are executing arbitrary code that they shouldn't be. Now we have something to start with. We know we're under attack. We can start investigating, see what it's doing, trace it down, kick it out. From the point of view of blacklisting or whitelisting code or allow and uh, safe listing uh, or deny listing code, the typical approach on Windows is code signing. So in short, this is attaching a signed hash of the file. So we'll make a hash of the file We'll, uh, we'll sign that hash with a certificate where the public key is on the machine to verify against, but we've signed with a private key on a trusted machine. Uh, and then we can verify that on every use. And depending on your configuration, the kernel will verify that whenever you start running a binary file. Uh, Python now, with the open code function, can also verify its code files against uh, cryptographically signed hashes. Uh, unfortunately, Python files don't have a standard for embedding a signature in them, which is the typical approach on Windows, uh, but we can use catalog signing. So a catalog file is essentially a list of hashes and file names for a set of files. The entire catalog is signed, and we can refer to that to see whether the file we're looking at has been signed and approved. 
Uh, the standard Python installers on Windows for a couple of versions now have included a signed catalog file for every non-binary file in the package. So if you've installed Python on Windows recently, you already have one of these catalog files that you can verify every file from the distribution against to see if it's been modified uh, or to see if something extra has been added or disallowed. Uh, and that file looks like this. So it has a handful of, of various properties. This one is signed by the Python Software Foundation as with all the files in the standard distribution. And that security catalog tab, which I didn't show because it looks like a random number generator output, is a list of all the hashes. So this is the code for doing it. This is literally all boilerplate. There is nothing interesting here at all. You copy paste this from somewhere just like I did. Uh, this is the interesting function call where we go, hey, Windows, can you verify whether we trust this file? And it will come back with a yes or no. And if it says no, then you don't trust that file you were bought and you get out. And what this means is we can run a, our build of SPython here uh, that has this enabled. And we can import URL lib. We can import async IO. Those are part of the standard library. They include pre-compiled binary files that have been signed. They include Python files that are included in the catalog. And because they're all there and they match, we're allowed to import them. And then if we try and import some unsigned file, we get an error message. Uh, the error in this case has come straight from the operating system. No signature was present in the subject. You can totally replace that with a different error message. Of course, this is not a built-in feature of Python at this point. You have to add this in based on our code samples, if you like. You can, you can return any error message you like at all. And bringing this all together, in the latest updates to Windows, uh, to Windows 10 and Windows Server 2016, 2019, we now have a feature called Windows Defender Application Control, previously known as Device Guard, if you've heard that name. Uh, this allows a kernel-enforced configurable policy for allowing denying applications from running, uh, which is actually just a short way of saying it's a massive XML file. Uh, it allows you to use either signatures or catalog files or file names or paths or other attributes to determine whether executable files are allowed to be run or not. Uh, it's already integrated with event logging and detectors. It provides good feedback for users. So you don't just get random error messages, you get helpful messages. Uh, one thing I didn't put on that list is your configuration is signed and includes the list of people that are allowed to sign replacements for that configuration, which is a very nice feature uh, it means that you can't actually break into someone's machine and replace their configuration with one that allows you to do stuff unless you're signing it with a certificate that they previously said was allowed to sign it. So you end up with this chain of allowed configurations that keeps things really nice and secure. So how this looks. Uh, on this machine, here's my Python install. You can see SPython towards the bottom there, but I'm on the regular Python. Uh, what I've done is I've explicitly banned python.exe from running on this machine. Everything here except for SPython is signed with the Python Software Foundation certificate, but I've explicitly banned python.exe. So if I try and run that, then I get this big pop-up message, uh, which admittedly is not the most helpful message, but it's better than simply saying access denied, which is what you'd probably expect. And if I try and run it from, the, from PowerShell, then I get a similar message, uh, program python.exe has failed to run, contact your support person for more info. So this is an IT configuration set up for your machine that will prevent applications from running. Like I said, big XML file, this is about half of my part of the XML file that gets merged into one that's about 20 times longer that lets the rest of Windows run, because by default you can block all of Windows from running with one of these things. Uh, this is the interesting part. We explicitly allow the SPython executable, because it's not signed. We allow anything signed by the PSF, and then we deny python.exe. And just for fun, I've denied SQLite, C-types, and libssl because that was part of my example that I was demoing with. If you grab the sample code for this and try it, uh, for starters, I recommend doing it on a virtual machine, not your main one. Uh, but then after that, you'll find that you can't import SQLite or C-types or libssl either. Uh, and so in this case, if I run SPython, it will import a whole lot of modules. There's a lot of built-in modules uh, that are signed by the catalog file that are approved here. Otherwise, we wouldn't have gotten as far as the, the REPL prompt. But then when I import my unsigned file, it tells me it's blocked by policy. Again, that's a customized error message. You can do anything you like there. You can tear down the, you can shut down the entire machine at that point if that's what you want to do. Uh, it's completely custom code up to you. What happens when something fails validation? As an extra bonus, uh, 
I can tell from within the executable whether policy is being enforced on that machine or not. So I'm actually using that in this sample to disable the dash C command. So this is the code from earlier that was gonna say a, a nice hello to everyone, but I've blocked it. Uh, I've said you're enforcing code integrity policy on this, so I'm not gonna let anyone use dash C. There is an option to go into what's known as audit mode, which doesn't actually block anything, but every time you hit something that would be blocked, it's gonna log a, a message. So you get a nice record of everything that people are running, and you can go back uh, before you start enforcing it and whitelist all of those things that should be allowed to run. Uh, in this case, I print a different message and do let you use the dash C. This is just proof of concept that you can tell the difference from within the program. You can behave differently based on how it's configured, uh, which gives you a lot of flexibility to integrate Python with the operating system level protections that are available. As I said, all of these examples, and in fact, all of Christian's examples as of this morning are also in this repository. Uh, feel free to go and check those out. And now, we're gonna jump over to some of the Linux options. All right, thank you, Steve. So, uh, this is mostly on Linux. Some of the examples may work on macOS or BSD, but I haven't verified that yet. So, some of the points I wanna talk about is, first of all, a quick um, advertising from our talk tomorrow, detracing system tab. So I'm giving a talk about uh, tracing and profiling tomorrow. Uh, we're all about um, syslogging. Just a quick intro. Uh, Steve already covered uh, most of the logging for Windows. Syslog is kind of similar with similar feature set, but yeah. And how to do IO open code on Linux with kind of code signing. But so uh, some of the prerequisites to doing that is, of course, please install security updates. If you take anything from this talk, is the first point, always update your machines. So you don't want to run your uh, Python interpreter or your uh, application as a privileged admin user or as root because root usually can replace files and do other stuff. And lots of assumptions are you run away that you can't modify like your binaries easily. Uh, you also um, want to restrict where you can write to, what things you can write and modifying your system, again, with unprivileged users. Um, you want, especially running containers, run some kind of kernel security policy. So uh, there's AppArmor, there's SLinux, there's Tomojo. There are different kinds to further restrict uh, what different kinds of application a special context can execute and modify and do on the system. And finally, you want to configure a central logging, like there's syslog, there's rsyslog, or there's journalD if you're running systemd enabled systems. Uh, and forward your events to some remote machine so that attacker can't override and destroy your log files. And just to so the first point, uh, system type and dtrace, that's a way to uh, tell the kernel uh, to um, log what's going on. Um, again, I will, tomorrow I will show more details how to use these kind of features more elaborately, but as part of the uh, PEP 578, I added uh, marker so you can actually audit. And if you run this script here that attaches to Python and use the audit probe and just prints out the string, the first argument of the string, and if you run like Python 3.8 C pass, you see like, okay, in the end it's running a command here, it compiles something and then exit the actual pass. So that's the one to uh, integrate with system tab and dtrace. Uh, logging. So uh, syslogging is very easy on um, most Unix systems. You have to first open the log file, which actually uh, um, not necessarily required, but you can configure what you do. And this example, I'm giving some options that in case logging doesn't work at all, syslog may be down, it still prints something on your standard console and on STDR. And also the logs of pitch, so you want to know which process identifier does something funky on your system. And then you just, uh, if you have some kind of events, you call lock, syslog with the uh, severity, lock, like critical, and there's a format operator. And something you want to probably do if you run in something you want to app or the process, you don't want to run like exit or shut down the Python interpreter like manually. You want to use underscore exit, which just stop the process immediately without doing much of cleanup because if an attacker was able to modify your interpreter in a way, then the cleanup, the uh, shutdown, and the add exit hooks may do execute additional code, but you would just want to kill that one. And if you're running a container platform like Docker, Kubernetes, Podman, uh, whatever, 
you have to set up your container environment to have a syslog endpoint in your container. By default, you don't get that on, as far as I know, most container platforms. So that's something you should keep in mind. So how could you implement uh, IO open code on Linux because we don't have this fancy catalog files like on Windows, which is really cool. So I came up with a rather simple proof of concept um, that does some verifications. For example, um, one thing I want to verify is that my file is actually a regular file, not some kind of socket or pipe or something special on a special file system. And I also want to deny any kind of non-executable file system. So uh, don't execute something that's maybe stored on the proc file system. If you have a hardened system, you often mark your temp directory as non-executable. So you can't like copy a binary to that and execute that. The kernel will disallow that. And you can do the same kind of checking also manually. Um, I do the usual dance, I load my file into a byte.io and then use the OpenSSL libraries, which are used by Python anyway, to hash the file content and then verify the file content against a special property uh, contained in an extended file attribute. Uh, the example is uh, also on Steve's um, GitHub repository. So what's an extended file attribute? So extended file attribute is a feature uh, on Linux and also Windows has something similar, with, I think it's called streams. It's kind of similar. So you just have like key value pairs uh, attached to your files or directories. There are some additional properties you can uh, store mostly arbitrary data. There's also namespace. You have like usually four namespaces. You have user, you have trusted, you have system and security. Uh, the three last ones are restricted to for something even a kernel policy to do something with that. So I use the user one and the user attributes are uh, controlled by something called DAC, a discrete access control, uh, better known as the standard user group, other people read, write, execute bits. So if you can read a file, you can also read the user attributes, you can write to a file, you can modify or create or delete extended file attributes. And the whole concept is inspired by something called IMA, Integrated Measurement Architecture, which is something like code signing and verification, which is currently under development in the Linux kernel. And just to look at that, so it's uh, how it looks on the shell. So I created a bunch of different um, files using XNF attribute with a hash. And this is one file like the OSPI, and this is my user.org.python. So the standard suggests you should use some kind of an identifier based on your domain name you own. This is the hash. And that use actually get f attribute, it's file attribute to the internal API, it's x attribute, f attribute. So it's a bit confusing, but not that part. So example, so if I have a like modified OSPI file that doesn't match, my example will just crash and tell me hmm, there's a mismatch uh, during the import. And then I have a script that can be used both to generate and update the hashes. Like after updating um, Python to a new version, you need to regenerate these. Uh, it's a very simple Python script that just creates a new one. And then I can run my example again, and just it just works. And the script is fairly easy. I just have a list of file names, Python file names. I uh, use the hashlib model to uh, hash the content here with SHA-566, and then use set x utro to update the hash. Yeah, that's it. So there are some caveats. Uh, you need to, if you would use that in production, you need to actually protect the ones, because uh, a user or attacker that goes control could, in theory, create its own Python files and add its own hashes. So um, either you have to use uh, one of the protected namespaces, which I can't use easily without using uh, special powers or a kernel policy. You could also do something like a signed hash, but it's going to be slow if you uh, do the signing for every file. So the catalog files, you have like a list of hashes, and the whole catalog is signed one time, but you do it every time, can be uh, slow. Or if you run a container as a uh, application, you can also do something like uh, blocking the syscall. So there's a tool set on Linux kernel called seccomp, which blocks and disallows um, to execute syscalls. And yet if you have to uh, block three different syscalls uh, here, uh, again, tomorrow morning at 10.30, 
Um, I will explain that uh, during my talk by the Q3. And there are also some open issues with that. So you can do something with LD preload or writing like uh, parts of your program. Uh, if you want to test that with a container, so initially I wanted to offer a, a container, you can play around with that, but there's some problems with how you can store this user attribute in a container image. It doesn't work quite that. There's a, an issue of that. You can also uh, allow a user or attacker to write to proc self mem, which is just a file that is actually the whole process memory of your process. You can work around that. Um, deal open is something that we're both facing issues on Windows and on uh, Unix platforms is that's the call you use to open a extension binary. So if you have a C extension Python model or like a C type CFFI uh, library you load, that takes a file name. And there's no easy way to verify the content of these binaries without being subject to a time of use, time of check uh, operation. And there's a fun attack called Snake Eater, which abuses memory uh, file descriptors and deal open and the proc file system to actually download a binary and inject some stuff. And there are probably many, many more things that can go wrong. Again, there's just a small list of things that can happen. There's currently an effort to implement a new feature in the Linux kernel called OmayExec. So that's a flag for the um, open syscall. It's a hint for the Linux kernel to tell them, okay, I'm opening a file, but this file actually may be something I'm planning to execute. It contains code. Uh, it comes from uh, GNU Linux Clip OS 4, uh, security distribution for Linux. And there are a couple of um, videos and uh, talks about that topic. And with OMA exit, the kernel knows, okay, this is a binary file that maybe contain code or a text file that contains code, I have to do extra checks on that. And then you can have the kernel security policy perform additional checks like requiring to have the uh, X bit, the executable bit on the file, or deny uh, file opening on non exit file systems, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So closing, summary, Steve? So the whole idea here is that when your security is good, audit hooks can make it better. <clears throat> There's a long list of things that as a security engineer you need to do to lock down your production systems. If you miss anything on that list, this point is not going to save you. It's probably not even going to help you. It's just going to end up wasting your time if you missed anything earlier. These hooks are intended to provide transparency. Security is your job. Python is going to help you with that by making sure you're aware, you can see what's going on. Uh, and along with everything else on your operating system that's helping with that, it gives you that added information to make smart decisions uh, and to make fast decisions when, when the, the time needs it. <clears throat> These hooks enable the use of operating system technologies that have often been around for decades at this point, but were previously unavailable to Python. They do require custom implementation. There is some work involved. We hope this whirlwind tour has been uh, some inspiration and, and hopefully extra information for that. Python now gets to play with the rest of the operating system world as far as securing and hardening things. And of course, the most important point. Well, yeah, please install security updates, please. <laughs> so thank you very much for coming. Uh, here are some helpful resources. <clears throat> I, I believe we are out of time for questions, so feel free to come and chat with us outside. We'll be hanging around just out there. Contact us on Twitter. More, we'd love to hear what you'd like to do with this, how you'd like to be able to use it, what you want to integrate it with. Uh, so please come and chat with us. Thank you. Thank you.